Quinn Ushla, Taas Aram, Vet is shut in you, Ini Donalo. Is no more Dumsa Lerat in you. The topic of this year's um, McGill Summer School is Ireland at the crossroads. And indeed, Ireland is at a crossroads. In some ways, we're always at a crossroads. And whether individually or as a county or as a nation, we're faced with specific choices about where to go, what to do, which way to turn, or just to stand still. I believe that the United States is also at a crossroads uh, at this time, in some ways very much like Ireland and in some ways very different than Ireland. But often when we face a crossroads, uh, there's an easy option. Um, that, that, road may, that crossroads may point us to an easy way uh, to an end. But most of us know that the easy route generally isn't in the long run the best route and after all, the easiest road doesn't always lead to the best place. And if it did, then there would never really be a crossroads to worry about in the first place. Uh, I, I am from America, and I am a big baseball fan. And there is a famous American baseball player who stems from my hometown of St. Louis, Missouri, by the name of Yogi Berra. And Yogi Berra, uh, amongst, besides being a very good baseball player, is very good at torturing the English language. And he has a number of uh, very famous sayings, which at first may not sound like they impart wisdom, uh, but upon some reflection, uh, sometimes they do. One of my favorites is, uh, baseball is 90% mental, uh, the other half is physical. <laughs> uh, my personal favorite, uh, however, is uh, when he's, he's fond of saying, it's like deja vu all over again. But he has a great saying uh, about uh, a crossroads, and, and, and it is this. Whenever you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> um, and I think, I think that what Yogi meant, God bless him, uh, was really something more like uh, our famous poet Robert Frost wrote so eloquently in a, in a famous poem called The Road Not Taken. And in that, uh, Robert Frost wrote... Uh, two roads diverge in a woods, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The United States at certain points in, his, in its history, as you know, has taken the road less traveled by. At times, taken a road that's never been traveled before, and it has made all the difference, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad. But while some of the roads may be more traveled today, they can still make all of the difference. The crossroads I'm talking about specifically and the crossroads about this program is really the fork in the road, or if you will, the way I think about it is, how do we think about and evaluate risk? Or the other side of the coin, how do we think about and evaluate failure? especially in the area of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship, as you probably know, is where the fear of failure goes to die. For those of us who aren't entrepreneurs, and indeed most of us aren't and most of us can't be, uh, we need to enable those who are by making sure that they can implement their best ideas if they can't do it here in Ireland or they can't do it in the United States, these innovators will do it elsewhere. It wasn't always that way, but now we live in a very global economy where innovators need to innovate. They'd rather innovate at home if we let them, but if not, they'll take their innovation elsewhere. Present-day America was built in part on entrepreneurship. As President Calvin Coolidge is famously reported to have said, the business of America's business. And that's true, it was true in Calvin Coolidge's day, and it's even more true today. It became that way in part, and continues that way in part, because of the American attitude towards risk and the American attitude towards failure. Thomas Edison, perhaps the world's greatest inventor, 
exemplified that thought, and he captured the attitude of many Americans towards risk and failure quite succinctly, quite succinctly when he said, I have not failed. I've simply found 10,000 ways not to succeed. <laughs> Mind you, that's coming. That's coming from a man who received over 1,000 patents in the United States alone and many more in Europe. The number of times he failed, or did not succeed at least, is beyond count. You know, under some short-sighted standards, he would be considered one of the biggest failures in the history of the United States. But that standard clearly didn't apply to Edison, and in some ways, a failure in America doesn't define a person at all. Robert F. Kennedy once said, only those who dare to fail greatly can ever achieve greatly. In other words, reasonable risk is admired. But the risk Americans are often willing to take isn't limited to their shores and aren't confined to, their own bound, to our own boundaries. And that explains, in part, the extraordinary bilateral relationship between the United States and Ireland, particularly as it exists today. I'm talking about investments. Some of the very first multinationals to invest in Ireland were from the United States. And since the 1970s, total United States investment in Ireland has grown by leaps and by bounds. It reached, it exceeded actually, a total of 240 billion euro, 240 billion dollars in 2013, or more than 200 million euro. Ireland has the sixth most U.S. investment of all countries in the world. It has more United States uh, FDI than the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South America combined. But no one, but one fascinating detail about that investment uh, that I found, that I find particularly telling is when those investments have been made. Nearly $130 million, billion dollars of the entire figure came to Ireland between the years 2008 and 2012. Between the years 2008 and 2012, some of the darkest days in Ireland's economic recent history. In other words, the United States was betting on Ireland at a time when Ireland wasn't betting on Ireland. Uh, and that was, that was risky in some ways, but in many ways was a statement of confidence that the United States had and the educated, hard-working workforce in Ireland. It wouldn't be accurate uh, to say that risk-taking, that a risk-taking mindset doesn't exist in Ireland because it, it has. Ireland has embraced risk in significant ways in the past. For example, just one great example is when Ireland made third-level education free. Now, that was a tremendous risk for a country uh, to take. It was a very bold step, but the result uh, has been a well-educated population which has served Ireland very, very, very well, uh, informing uh, an impressive, uh, excuse me, forming an impressive talent pool which has been put to use by many companies, American multinationals, Irish companies, and other companies that have invested here. Uh, I've visited quite a few of the big Irish companies since my arrival in October, and I have been regularly and highly impressed by the quality of the workforce uh, here in Ireland. Perhaps one of the biggest risks and one of the biggest leaps forward is still very much in evidence today. Some 60 years ago, T.K. Whitaker, whom I understand a special uh, event is going to be held on Tuesday here in this conference, um, proposed a drastic change to how the Irish economy worked. Uh, Mr. Whitaker looked outward beyond Ireland's shores, understanding the potential for Ireland by embracing an open economy, one that welcomed trade and welcomed investment. That has, incredibly, that has been incredibly innovative and inventive, and Mr. Whitaker undoubtedly understood the risks uh, that were involved in making this dramatic change. It took Taoiseach Sean Lamas, however, to bring forward that idea uh, and make it a reality. Was that risky? Of course it was. Absolutely it was. It wasn't the norm in those days, and it still isn't the norm. Some, some countries still feel that taking outside investment uh, inward 
is too risky. It causes too many problems. It has too many disruptions. But time and time and time again, the economists uh, show us that only those countries that have an active outward investment uh, prosper, and prosper much more quickly and much more actively than others. The outward-looking risk and embracing mindset of Ireland also led to Ireland's first application for uh, European Union membership in 1962, and while it took until 1973 for that to bear fruit, it was clearly, in retrospect, the right idea, the right thing for Ireland, and it remains so today. Ireland depends on its European partners, which can sometimes be troubling and recently has been a little bit um, nerve-wracking, perhaps exasperating, but economically, much more good has come than bad. Ireland has faced another crossroads very recently and took a road less traveled, uh, and indeed a road never traveled, uh, when it passed the same-sex marriage referendum. That choice was driven in large measure by the youth of Ireland, uh, which represents another huge demographic change, with 40% of Ireland now under the age of 30. That influence, uh, that, that, that influence and that diversity has made Ireland make that choice uh, in that referendum. While those examples are about Ireland's embracing risk as a nation at times, the same hasn't always seemed to hold for individuals. The individual Irish mindset on risk in the past has been a little bit different than the current mindset of risk in the United States. In the 1907 Irish book, The Aran Islands, uh, it was written, a man who is not afraid of the sea will soon be drowned, for he will go out on a day when he shouldn't. But we, but we do be afraid of the sea, and we shall only be drowned now and again. The quote hints at the hints, this 1907 book, hints at a traditional Irish, perhaps traditional Irish view of risk, Take as few as possible, and even then you might well lose and you won't ever have to worry about taking any more risks. But I understand this way of thinking uh, was reflected up until recently in areas such as bankruptcy law, as declaring bankruptcy was much more onerous here in, in Ireland than it is in the United States, and that reputational damage was long-lasting, if not everlasting. So the debtor, even after the bankruptcy period, was, might still find it very, very difficult to progress towards getting a loan or to starting a business. Uh, in e even if they had, in, in, the same, in the meantime, come along with a very, very good idea. Just imagine uh, if, that, if that mindset would have been applied to Thomas Edison. Uh, he would have failed. Uh, he would have declared bankruptcy. He would have never had a chance to go on for the second, uh, the, the second try and would have been forgotten. And while I've heard about uh, an Irish aversion to risk in the past, what I've seen since I came here in October really is something uh, quite different. Uh, I mentioned U.S. investment a second ago, and that investment increasingly funds innovative activities and research and development here in Ireland. I've been to a number of the U.S. companies here, and I see more examples of that than I could possibly list uh, in this talk that wouldn't make sense unless there were people here ready to, to search into the unknown, to take risks. But risk-taking is not about just a single moment. It requires sustained courage to endure uncertainty and the sometimes lonely existence of living off an idea that may not succeed. Creativity and discovery necessarily involve risks, so there will be dark days for you, Alan Hager wrote, after he won the Nobel, Peace, the Nobel Prize for Physics. But dealing with that risk, he said, is part of the thrill and part of the satisfaction. So there are some individuals, more than ever, embracing risk here in Ireland, but I don't see that as widespread yet as it will be, I think, in the future. Perhaps some are still held back by the property boom and have become even more risk adverse because of it, and that's certainly understandable. But in that context, uh, everyone was risking on the same thing. Real entrepreneurship involves a diversification of risks, risks about a variety of 
endeavors, about a variety of subjects, about a variety of possibilities, because it encompasses a potentially unlimited number of new ideas, and therefore the risk isn't as risky. To achieve greatly, uh, we must take a risk, a risk of failing, and perhaps of failing greatly. And sometimes that simply happens. Failure shouldn't be the end of the story, though, and it shouldn't keep us from trying again. Winston Churchill once wrote that success is stumbling from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Sounds a little bit like Thomas Edison to me. Okay. Failure does not have to be the end. It is only a part of the process that can and sometimes does and often does lead to success. Sometimes it's not the individual who dampen their own enthusiasm, but people who are around the innovators. This is, there is one way that we can, those of us who aren't entrepreneurs, those of us who aren't creative, can help those people who are, and that's to encourage them in, in their dark days, encourage them when things aren't going well, and encourage them to stay the course. Oscar Wilde once wrote, experience is simply the name we give our mistakes, which, a more, which is a more poetic way of the version that Henry Ford announced, that the only real mistake that we make is the one that we never learn anything from. Sometimes we may not succeed without failing first, because that teaches us something we wouldn't otherwise have known. Ultimately, Reasonable risk is the heart of our biggest thrills. Ask someone when he or she felt the most alive, and oftentimes they will tell you about a time that they took a risk. In reality, I see in Ireland now definitely, what I see in Ireland definitely embraces that innovative way of thinking and that willingness to take risks, to dare greatly. I have seen changes here so recently and nowhere more evident than in the Web Summit in the fall of 2014. Uh, we could talk about the event itself and how Petty Cosgrove took a rather strange idea and has now made it into a massive, a massive worldwide event, uh, something that's spawning uh, new ideas and, and new courages all across the globe, and including the United States. And it's a great story of risk and a great story of reward. But I'm thinking mainly about the participants in the Web Summit, those who bring the real energy to the summit. I see them in this willingness to embrace risk, to court failure, to rise from failures that have already occurred, a Thomas Edison attitude, perhaps, which is clearly growing in Ireland each day right now. This is a crossroads, and Ireland can choose to continue down that path, the path of risk, but almost inevitably, which will cause creative, energetic people to succeed. The future will be challenging and uncertain, but playing it safe will not be the safest path. I mentioned investment earlier, and it is a fact that the nature of the investment has changed since the 1970s. That investment became two-way uh, much more recently. Total investment now between the United States and Ireland, going both ways, in other words, uh, exceeds $400 billion and supports almost 300,000 jobs. And would you be surprised to know that the majority of those jobs are created by Irish companies in the United States? Okay. But for this kind of relationship to continue and to grow, innovation must continue as well, and I believe it will, but I also believe that there is plenty of room to help it along the way. And one of the best ways coming up in the future is something called TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which is a free trade agreement, uh, but potentially much, much more than a free trade agreement. We're also finding this will find ways to reduce regulatory controls uh, and other non tariff barriers, and will also maintain strong environmental and labor protections uh, for workers and for our earth. Now, there are a lot of good things about TTIP, but I want to just talk about one thing uh, in tonight's talk, and that is opportunity. When rules or circumstances change, opportunities appear. 
the people and the companies that are the most innovative, the ones that are the biggest risk takers and the least fearful of failure will take advantage of those opportunities. It's simply that simple. TTIP is primarily not about the big guys. Uh, Microsoft has already figured out how to work in Europe and Siemens has already figured out how to work in the United States. But TTIP is directed primarily at medium and small enterprises. People that have in the past have found it too daunting, European companies that have found it too daunting to, to, to try to work in the United States, and American companies that have found it too daunting to work into the EU. Uh, but if we do it right, TTIP will finally open the marketplace for those medium and small companies. And TTIP can open our marketplaces to a new burst of innovation by creating more and more and more entrepreneurs. In the United States and Ireland, we're at a crossroads yet again trying to determine how to address new immigration, both illegal immigrants who are already present and future legal immigrants. Ireland's demographic changes uh, are dramatic and they're quick. Just a decade ago, just a decade ago, one in six children born in Ireland were born of non-Irish parents. Today that's over one in five people born in Ireland. At least 50,000 people each year are emigrating to Ireland. It's going to change Ireland's face. Opening the doors to new immigration can feel risky, but it, is also, but it also creates opportunities and rewards that might not be realized otherwise. Another way that we can be better by embracing our diversity is what I call Creative Minds, a program that I started uh, a few months ago in which we bring uh, United States uh, musicians, entrepreneurs, authors, filmmakers to share their experiences with young Irish audiences. We intend to make and create new creative economic linkages and cultural connections that strengthen the already strong bonds between the United States and Ireland, but looks to strengthen those bonds to the next generation of Irish and the next generation of Americans so that your children and my children and your grandchildren and my grandchildren will be able to understand and able to feel the wonderful, warm relationship that has existed for so many years between the United States and Ireland. For example, we've had a score of, uh, we've had writers and, and directors, we've had musicians, we've had, uh, mu we've had directors of uh, animated Disney movies. Uh, just last week we had Glenn Hansard uh, from Ireland and America's uh, Paul Williams uh, do master classes uh, throughout Ireland and uh, try to connect in new and innovative ways uh, the young Irish and young Americans and looking towards the future. Winston Churchill said that success is not final and failure is not fatal and the courage to continue, it's the courage that continues that counts. Failure does not prevent us from starting again and even when we're successful, we must keep persevering and innovating and seeking to improve. So this week, uh, the discussion will be about Ireland at the crossroads. And I believe that one of the issues that, that is ripe for examination is the ability to take risk and the ability to evaluate failure and what happens. Looking at this, we can learn lessons that we can all remember when we are at various crossroads because when you are at that crossroads, as Yogi Berra once said, uh, and you must take, uh, you must, when you're at the crossroads, you must take it, uh, we learn that whatever road we take will involve risk and that not taking the crossroads involves risk itself by just remaining stable and not making any decisions. And I think that Ireland and the United States uh, have been very successful in the past by not uh, electing that and by when they come to the crossroads, when they come to the fork in the road, they take it. Good luck to you all this week. I hope that this, uh, this session is profitable uh, for you intellectually, that, um, that you all learn and benefit from it. It was delightful to be here uh, this evening. Uh, Guru, uh, sorry, 
Kurabaila Giv Galer.